exercise so that you can actually see how uh, we derive at different kinds of results. But I would like to start off this class by discussing or in fact reiterating something that we've already seen. Now if you look here, this is this is a list of, of most of the 4F group ions. All of them are trivalent. This is the electronic configuration. We apply Hohn's rules. Hohn's rules are a manifestation of the exchange interaction and uh, the spin orbit interaction. The first two rules come out of exchange interaction, interaction between the electrons. That is, S is maximized then you have to maximize L in conformance with the first rule and the third rule is a manifestation of a spin orbit interaction in which L and S couple together to give you an overall J and depending upon whether the shell is less than or more than half filled you get J equals L minus S or L plus S so using these Hund's rules one can find S, L, J and one can also find the term symbols corresponding to these ions now the value of j represents whether that particular spin is magnetic or not. You place it inside a magnetic field, this each j will split up into two j plus one levels. This is a paramagnetic ion with this corresponding value of j. It is described by a Brillouin function. It has a certain field and temperature dependence. You can get a susceptibility. So all of these are par paramagnetic ions. Now this is the value of P, the effective magnetic moment calculated from these values of L and J. You can calculate the lambda J factor, then you can put it inside the value for the effective magnetic moment, which depends upon the Bohr magneton, the value of J and GJ. And these are experimentally determined magnetic moments in units of the Bohr magneton. So notice that <clears throat> there is a finite number of electrons, so one electron, but the magnetic moment is not one Bohr magneton. These are fractional numbers, these are not integers, and they have nothing to do with the number of electrons inside the shell. These come out because of the fact that there are different S, L, and J values, and you have to insert these values into the proper formula to get the effective number of Bohr magnetons for that particular ion. You will see a really good correspondence between the experimental and theoretical values, okay? With a few exceptions, this particular ion, uh, paraseodymium, probably its magnetic moment is not available. There is a discrepancy here for europium uh, because all of these terms assume the ground state. These are the ground state terms. But there are also excited states, and if the excited states are present close to the ground state, there could be intermixing between the ground and excited state. So probably this is the reason why this experimental value does not match the theoretical value. For all other uh, ions, there is really good correspondence between the experimental and the theoretical value. So all is well and good for the 4F ions, the rare earths. However, if we come to the 3D ions, we apply the Moon's rules once again, we find the term symbols. This is the theoretical effective magnetic moment that comes out. <coughs> okay? So the effective magnetic moment you might all recall. Is given by so mu F over mu B is what we defined as P here. And this is gj, j, j plus 1, okay? So this value is plotted for all of these ions. This is the value of p. <clears throat> now you will observe that the, the experimentally determined magnetic moments, which come out from experimentally determined susceptibilities is 
vividly different from the theoretical values. So 1.55, 1.70, they're not similar. However, if I assume n to be equal to 0, if n equals 0, then j must equal s. So if instead of these values of j, I put in the value of s over here, and for s, we know that the Landry G factor is 2. If I use these values, instead of using the orbital angular momentum, I use just the spin, and I predict what <coughs> the effective magnetic moment is, then these moments are in fact good agreement with the experimental values. So something is wrong here. Something is clearly outside the scope of what we've been discussing so far. If you had a gas of these ions, for example, you had a gas of manganese chloride, then each, <coughs> in a gas, each molecule is separate from the other, which means you have free ions, then the experimental values are in good agreement with with these values. However, once you place these ions inside a solid matrix, inside a crystal, the values change, they depart, which means that the environment also has some influence on the ion. And this is something that we're going to study today. It's an important interaction when we start studying paramagnetic ions embedded inside a solid matrix, inside a crystal. So we're going to look at the crystal field effects and the crystal field interaction, which is an extremely important interaction. So this was the motivation. <coughs> now for the 4F, ions, we know that there is a spin orbit interaction and there is exchange interaction and the, this results in atomic states which are defined by J, the total spin quantum number, its azimuthal component L and S, which means that each ion has a specific value of J, L and S and these are good quantum numbers. Okay, J is determined by the spin orbit interaction, L and S are determined by the exchange interaction and the interaction between the electrons. So the four F ions have good values of J, L and S. These are in other words eigenstates of the overall Hamiltonian. However, in the 3D orbitals, the situation is totally different. We've seen that L and S are no longer good quantum numbers. So how do we describe this effect? If you look at this curve over here, this one over there, But I need to remember this. If you look at this curve, if you look at the 4f orbitals, this is 4f orbital. And this is closer to the nucleus as compared to 4s, 4p, and 4d. So it's closer, the 4f is closer to the nucleus. The valence shell is actually closer to the nucleus. 4s, 4p and 4d orbitals are further away from the nucleus. So the 4f orbital which houses the valence electrons is shielded from the environment because it's closer to the nucleus. This curve is a curve of the radial probability density of, of different orbitals. However, compare this with 3d. This is 3d. This is the probability density for 3D. This is 3P and this is 3S. 3D as compared to 3P and 3S, 
there is an appreciable fraction of this probability density which overlaps with 3s and 3p and it is not as good it's not as well shielded from the environment as the 4f orbital in other words the 3d orbital extends to regions further away from the nucleus so it has a greater greater propensity of being affected by the environment and the question is how does the environment affect the 3d orbital for that what we need to see is a model this kind of interaction in which the orbitals are interacting with the field of the crystal is called the crystal field interaction okay now we know that if i have an ion say a metal ion which is a k ion it's positively charged and this is in the vicinity of n ions negatively charged ions for example oxygen okay so this is an oxygen a in ion another oxygen in ion in ion in ion in ion these are negatively charged centers each carrying a charge of two electrons now whatever the orbitals of this metal cation or for example if i consider the pz orbital and if i draw the probability density for the for the pz orbital then this negatively charged cloud is in the vicinity of another negatively charged in ion and there is a interaction which means that this interaction will change the energy of this orbital as compared to another orbital so if i draw the px orbital suppose this is the px orbital the energy of this orbital might or be different it might or might not be different so different orbitals interact with neighboring ions in different manners these neighboring ions are generally called ligands and these ligands are disposed around the central paramagnetic ion in different ways so the ion is encapsulated in different kinds of cages of the ligands this means that the crystal structure itself will have an effect on the energy levels and different kinds of orbitals will interact with differently and if i would like to write down the hamiltonian for this interaction this hamiltonian corresponds to a certain energy so what this hamiltonian will be this hamiltonian will be given by the interaction of the charge density of the metal electrons with the potential that the electron sees and that potential is created by the ligands so this is going to be rho into some potential at that particular location which is created by the ligands so in this manner one can find out the energies of the different orbitals now in all the d orbitals if in a free ion are at the same energy so there are five kinds of d orbitals we all know that all of them have the same energy they are degenerate those d orbitals are labeled as d z square d x square minus y square d x y d x z and d y z all of these five orbitals have the same energy they are degenerate however once this ion in which there could be some electrons in these d orbitals okay there are some electrons in these d orbitals now when this ion is placed inside an environment the energy of the different orbitals might change and the degeneracy might in fact be lifted and the lifting of the degeneracy is encapsulated by the hamiltonian there this these electrons see a new hamiltonian which is the crystal field hamiltonian 
So this acts now as a perturbation on 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 these orbitals and we have to find out the corrections to the energy due to the crystal field Hamiltonian. For that purpose we need to find out what the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian are. Since all of these are degenerate we have to use degenerate perturbation theory. So it's important to find out the eigenstates of the crystal field Hamiltonian. It turns out that these five orbitals that I've written over here are eigenstates of this Hamiltonian. Now it's important to realize what these orbitals actually look like. So it's nice to draw diagrams and I'll show you how to draw these diagrams on the computer as well. The D, if I define these to be my axes, the x-axis, the y-axis and the z-axis, then the dz orbital looks something like this. Okay, This is the probability I'm drawing here, uh, the probability density. Okay, the D's, this is the d z square orbital. Likewise, I have the d x y orbital. The d x y orbital has has the lobes on the x and the y axis. Okay, so this is d x y. Likewise, I have three different, three other orbitals. Now, what I'm trying to do, I'm making this the x-axis and this the y-axis, so I can easily draw the remainder of the three orbitals. And I'm looking at this configuration from the top. So the dxy orbital has its lobes in between the axes. Okay, so this is dxy. Likewise, I can have dxz. dxz has this, sorry, is dx squared minus y squared. This, this is dxz. This is dxy. And I have the fifth one, which is dyz. So this is the y-axis. This is the z-axis. So there are five different kinds of orbitals. Okay? And where do these orbitals, where do these shapes come from? These are nothing but spherical harmonic functions. If you look at, this, at, at these documents that I've given you here, <clears throat> I'm going to go slow today because I'm going to do quite a few calculations. So if you look at this document, which I'm pulling off, on, on the screen here. So, <clears throat> if you look here, the d orbitals correspond to the spherical harmonic functions in which L is equal to 2. So this, this, and this. These correspond to d orbitals. Okay? So this has L equals 2 and N equals plus minus 2. L equals 2, M equals plus minus 1. L equals 2, M equals 0. So you'll notice that these have complex terms. These particular orbitals have complex terms. Okay? So what you need to do, but these terms over here, they are not complex. These are real orbitals. And these are eigenfunctions of the crystal field Hamiltonian, not these orbitals. So you have to create superpositions of these orbitals to create these orbitals. Okay? So let me explain that now. So if you look at the screen over there, <clears throat> d z square, which corresponds to the spherical harmonic function in which l equals to m l equals 0. 
function of theta and phi. This term over here, this thing, is given by 5 over 16 pi 3 cosine square minus 1. Now this is real, this is fine. Okay? And I, if I plot this function, this is what I get. Okay? Remember that if you equate this equal to 0, then this corresponds to a certain angle theta and that theta is this angle. It's called the magic angle. It's about 54.74 degrees. Okay? So this is the dz square orbital. Now if I would like to you will notice that if I take y2 plus 2 theta and phi and I add to this y2 minus 2 theta and phi and for normalization if I divide this by under root 2 okay on its own y2 plus 2 corresponds to this thing over here and it has a complex number now if I take the take y equals with two terms with opposite values of m that is m2 and m minus 2 and I add them together I'm going to add these terms one with plus and one with minus so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to get 15 over 32 pi under root sine square theta e i2 phi plus e minus i2 phi which gives me uh, one half of cosine of 2 theta if I add the positive e i2 theta plus e minus i2 theta that's equal to 2 times cosine 2 theta and I also have this under root 2 here so now this is a superposition of two orbitals okay this orbital on its own was an eigenstate of the atomic Hamiltonian you solve the Schrodinger equation, you get this orbital as a solution. But now if you would like to find the eigenstates of the crystal field Hamiltonian, you can test that this alone will not be an eigenstate. So you need to create a superposition of two states, of two wave functions or two spherical harmonics, which generates a, an eigenstate of the crystal field Hamiltonian. And the appropriate eigenstate is this one. Okay? So this is what is called D x square minus y square and this is plotted over here notice that this is maximum when theta equals 90 degrees that's why it's in the equatorial plane and this is maximum when theta equals uh, 0 or 90 degrees sorry 5 when phi equals 0 or 90 degrees. You're taking the square of this because you, you're plotting probability densities. Okay? So now we have found out these two particular orbitals. Likewise, we can find out those orbitals over there. Okay? D, <coughs> if I take, and, and what are those orbitals? Those orbitals, I have, I have calculated these orbitals. If I take the difference of these orbitals, I will get another eigenstate. But then I would like to make this real. So eventually I multiply this with minus iota as well. This will make this function real. Because if I take the difference, 
I get iota sine 2 phi here. So I want to make this real. So I multiply this with minus iota. And I get something. Okay. I get something. I don't want to calculate this. This I can do easily in, in some software. So this is another eigenstate. This corresponds to to something to either one of these okay since I have <coughs> sine square theta sine of 2 phi so it corresponds to d x y okay when phi is 45 degrees this is maximized so this is d x y likewise my d x z and my dyz will be given by superpositions of 2 plus 1 theta phi plus minus <coughs> by 2 <coughs> minus i theta phi over under root 2 okay with the appropriate uh, Factor. So, with the plus sign, I have plus iota. Okay. Again, okay. with the plus sign, I multiply this with plus iota to make this real. And if I have negative sign, I multiply this with just one. Okay. So I can generate the other orbitals. Likewise, I can generate all five orbitals. And in the absence of a crystal field, all all of these orbitals are the same. But this, these are just the spherical harmonic part. These are just the angular part. They depend upon theta and phi. Each one of them depends upon theta and phi. But the orbital actually has a radial part as well. And since we're talking about a 3D orbital, I have to multiply each one of these by the corresponding radial part in which n equals 3, l equals 2. So I multiply each one of these with the corresponding R to obtain the overall orbital, right? Because the orbital has a radial part as well. So this is the complete orbital. What we've drawn here are just the angular parts. It's really difficult to draw the radial part along with this. And where are the radial parts? The radial parts are also given in the same sheet. So if you look here, I need to insert this value of R to generate the radial part. Okay, so each one of these is multi multiplied with the corresponding radial part of the wave function, which has n equals 3 and L equals 2. Now we have defined the orbitals. These orbitals are superpositions of eigenstates of the atomic Hamiltonian and all five of these are eigenstates now of the crystal field Hamiltonian. And you can test this. You can always test this. Okay? Uh, you, you must test this. Whether these are really eigenstates of the crystal field Hamiltonian. Yes, they are. You can test this. Now what we would like to do if the ion with these particular orbitals is placed inside a crystal are the energies of these five orbitals the same or different how are the energies split up how is the degeneracy lifted so that's what we're going to do now okay and we're going to perform a calculation a laborious lengthy calculation but i'll do it on computer so things will be easy but i would like to show you the flow of argument here okay now this 3d ion is embedded inside a host solid and this is what magnetism is really all about you talk about solids not gases gases magnetism in gases just forms an iota of the whole field of magnetism so you need to put things inside solids okay the original motivation for work of this kind was when people started making lasers if you remember ruby the ruby laser which was the one of the first lasers made in 1960 by Theodore Mammon was a chromium ion, a chromium 3 ion, which is a 3D ion, 
inside a matrix of aluminium oxide sapphire this is ruby now the optical transitions in ruby in chromium give you the red color right you have erbium doped which is a rare earth ion fiber lasers so the original motivation for studying these paramagnetic ions was indeed in the realm of optics and laser technology neodymium gag in which you have a neodymium ion which is a rare earth placed inside yttrium aluminum garnet is another example now what we would like to do we would like to find out their energies of these orbitals but first of all we need to pick up an environment g this is some new question of <clears throat> so i just want to clarify that uh, we are studying the 3d orbitals because they are at the outermost if you can say in terms of not really outermost but they they reach is further away from the nucleus there is a greater propensity that they will be influenced by the crystal field very well cheap so the 4f <clears throat> for the 4f ion the moon's rules are satisfied the exchange and spin orbit interaction is stronger than the crystal field interaction so we have two regimes if the spin orbit interaction is stronger than the crystal field interaction then what we learned so far is fine and the moon's rules work so the hund's rules work mostly okay remember the hund's rules are also semi empirical in nature they have they have, they have a motivation but these rules are semi empirical so this is true for 4f for 3d the crystal field hamiltonian is stronger than the spin orbit or the exchange interactions which are determined by the interaction between the electrons so the influence on of the environment is larger so that dominates and steers what kind of orbitals are formed okay so this is true for 3d and other transition metals now let's pick up an environment so there are different kinds of environments one of the most popular environments is an octahedral environment <clears throat> in an octahedral environment as the name suggests there is a central metal ion and it's coordinated by six ligands negatively charged and the assumption is that each one of these ions these n ions is a point charge this assumption breaks down in certain cases but for simplicity let's assume that the six are n ions each carrying a charge q which is negative is is a point charge this is my x axis this is my y axis this is my z axis <coughs> all right now this is the octahedral environment now in the octahedral environment the distance of this ion from each n ion could be the same or different if it's the same we call this that the it's an octahedral environment with cubic symmetry okay if each one of these distances is the same let's call this distance d it's an octahedral environment which tells you the coordination and its cubic symmetry because each one of these distance is the same it could be tetragonal in which one of the distances is different it could also be orthorhombic in which all three kinds of distances are different but let's assume that it's cubic symmetry octahedral environment another uh, important environment is the tetrahedral environment if i would like to draw the tetrahedral environment i will draw a cube
the metal ion, the 3D ion is at the body center of the cube and this is coordinated by four anions on the diametrically opposite diagonals of the two edges. This is called the tetrahedral environment. Okay? So, this forms actually a tetrahedron, that's why it's called a tetrahedron. You can look at pretty visualization of this on, on the internet. This is the tetrahedral environment. And if each one of these distances is the same, it's called a tetrahedral environment with cubic symmetry. In terms of group theory or in crystallography, this kind of arrangement is denoted by O, H, and this is denoted by TD. Okay. This, okay. Now let's focus on the octahedral environment and suppose that I have a 3D one ion, which means one electron. And a, a, a D orbital with just one electron. Placed inside an octahedral environment with cubic symmetry. Now I need to find out the crystal field Hamiltonian. Okay, which means I need to find out the wave function of the d orbitals which are written over here and I need to find out the potential. So if I would like to find out the potential, the crystal field potential is a function of x, y and z. I am sure this is something that you will immediately recognize. Now each one of these anions is being treated as a, as a point charge. So this equals each one of them has a charge q, q over 4 pi epsilon naught and the distance of each one of them, okay? So, <clears throat> 1 over x minus d whole square plus y square plus z square due to one of these charges plus all other terms. There are 5 more terms. Okay, one along the x axis. One is this sign and the other is this sign. Their coordinates are plus t and minus t. Plus four more terms. Now I'm going to write these four terms together for compactness. One over x square plus y plus minus d whole square plus z square. plus x square plus y square plus z plus minus d whole square and root. So this is the crystal field Hamiltonian. Now I need to find out the energies of the orbitals. Right? <clears throat> it's just so I'm finding the potential at some point x, y, z and the d orbital, whatever d orbital we're talking about is extending in space. So I would like to find out the potential at this point multiply with the charge density at this point which comes out from the wave function and integrate over entire space. This is how the potential varies with space and I know how the orbitals give you a different probability densities. So now I know how to construct the Hamiltonian. Now what I need to do is that I need to find out the energies. Now it appears that these orbitals are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. So energies which are the perturbations in energy are simply found out by terms of this kind. Now for simplicity, since I want to use the computer, I would like to relabel these states. I call this D1, all of this, I call it D1 for simplicity because I would like to put a symbol in the computer. I call it D1, D2, D3, and D4 and 5. So D4 and 5 is this entire state over here. So what I need to do, I need to calculate 
एच सी एफ डी आई डी आई सिंस दीज आर आई गन स्टेट इफ दिस इज डी जे एंड जे इज नॉट द सेम एज आई गन दिस टर्न ऑफ डी जी गो सो आई नीड टू कैलक्युलेट टर्न ऑफ दिस काइंड आई हैव द्रिस्टो फील्ड हेमिटोनियन ओके नाउ द क्रिस्टो फील्ड हेमिटोनियन is this is just a perturbation so i need to find out i need to expand this term and put it in here and i put the orbitals or the wave functions from what i have written over there now i'm going to do all of this on my computer in front of you okay so that you can follow the chain of chain of how to do this calculation ji you know and so the the perturbation have to know will itself be integral Yeah, so this is an integral. This is an inner product. It has to be found through integral. So what I need to do, I need to find this. So <clears throat> what I need to do is q over four pi epsilon naught. Okay. now this thing is negative i have a single electron so when that ne this negative charge interacts with an electron it produces an energy proportional to e into q that single electron is coming from the d orbital integral over all of volume now this thing corresponds to a wave function which i have written over there psi d1 d2 d3 right complex conjugate function of r theta and phi there's a radial part and an spherical part and i need to find out this thing let's i will call all of this some v some potential v okay is a function of r theta and phi because x y and z are functions of r theta and phi so i put a v here function of r theta and phi and then i need to put this thing in here so i put in psi r theta phi so i need to calculate this integral so didn't we write the hamiltonian initially as integral itself in the first book we were taking multiple charges and taking or is it this it's the same thing it's the same it's the same thing That right. So that's the total energy of the system. Okay, so this is something we need to calculate. This is in full spirit of the perturbation theory. This is the perturbative Hamiltonian, and these are the corrections to the energy. And we're lucky that these we have found out the eigenstates, so we can easily compute these inner products. Now let's do this. Let's write a computer program that actually does this. Let's do it step by step. all right first of all i define a potential now this potential is 1 over square root times what i have written over here i have defined this okay 
exactly the same as what I've written on the blackboard. This defines a potential. Now, I would, what I would like to do, I would like to express this as a series. So, <clears throat> as a series which has terms in x, x square, y square, z square, x square, y square, z square, right? I would like to expand this as a series. What I do a series, like to expand phi p, and I would like to return a certain number of terms. From x goes from 0 to 6, y goes from 0 to 6, and z goes from 0 to 6. And I would also like to I call, I call this S1 and I would like to also tell my software that okay that's fine that D is positive D is positive that's going to take some time because computing converting this into a series is not easy okay sorry full simplify So what you see here, you get Z4 term, Z6 term, and terms of the order of Z7, etc., etc., etc. But this is not this is not the form that we like this to be in because Y4 is being multiplied by Z4. So what I want to do, I would like to separate out terms x square, y square, z square, x square, y square separately, x square, z square separately, etc. So in order to do this, I perform a, a, a trick in Mathematica. What I do is I define a function h which takes two arguments and if alpha is less than beta then this function is 1 otherwise it is 0. So I just define this. This is just a mathematical trick, nothing to worry about. So now what I do is I want to find out the coefficients of s1. Suppose I write x square plus x square into y plus x into y square and I find the coefficient in this expression of x square I get y. The coefficient of x square in this expression is y. Okay. If I find the coefficient of x, it turns out to be y squared. So coefficient is a function that picks out coefficients. Now what I've done over here is I pick out coefficients from S1 which is the series that I developed. But I multiply the series with x, y, z. This is just a trick. I multiply the series with x, y, z and I pick out coefficients of s1 into x, y, z. Okay, so there is an x, y, z in every term. Otherwise, there will be terms like x square, which does, don't have a y or z. And I would like terms to be presented in a certain way. So I multiply the series with x, y, z, and I would like to find out the coefficient in this series of x raised to power p plus 1, y raised to power q. 2 plus 1, z is for r plus 1 and I would like the sum of these coefficients to be less than 4. Okay, so I, I want terms like x square, y square, z square, x is for 4 but I don't want terms like x square, y square, z square because here the sum of the coefficient is 6. I would like to truncate at a certain point. Therefore, I multiply this function with h and then I would like to sum up over all of these terms. So, let's see what this thing does. So it's going to take some time to run this probably, it's running S2, let's see what my S2 looks like. Now this is my S2, nice, nice simple form. It has separated out terms of x5, x square, y square, y4, x square, z square. So it has simplified my and truncated my series to the terms that I desire. These are just mathematical tricks that I play, okay. Now this is my potential, this is my V. The first term is immaterial. It does not have an x, y, or z dependence. 
So it just gives a reference to the potential and it does not contribute to the energies. So I can leave this term. So what I do, I define this to be my V. Okay. Now what I would like to do, I define my V equals this thing over here. This is my V. Okay. Let's also write down this V on the blackboard. This is what's going to go in here. Okay, so now I need to decide what goes into the wave functions. And of course, x is equal to r cosine theta cosine pi, y equals r cosine theta r sine pi, z equals r cosine theta, sorry, r x equals r sine theta cosine pi y equals r sin theta sin phi and z equals r cosine theta. So you have to convert to polar coordinates if you would like to stick to polar coordinates. So this is now my potential. First of all, notice it's symmetric because the environment is totally symmetric. It's a cubic environment, cubic symmetry, it's totally symmetric. So it doesn't have terms like x, y and z. It has all even square, even uh, powers. So this is one nice thing. All of these terms are on equal footing. All of these terms are on equal footing because of the symmetry of the environment. Now we would like to define our wave functions. D1, D2, D3, D4, D5 and so on. Okay, let's do that now. Over there. <coughs> First of all, I define my radial function. The radial function is picked up from the ha handout that I've given you. It's R32. Here it is. It's exactly similar to R32, which is in table 13.2, 8 over 81, square root 1 over 20 pi, 1 over 20 there's no pi here pi a cube r over a a naught now is the Bohr radius square into exponent minus this is my r okay this is the radial part of the wave function for the 3d orbital now each one of the these is being multiplied by a spherical harmonic by the functions that I've written over there now my d1 equals R32, the radial part, multiplied with a spherical harmonic with n equals 2, n equals 0. Spherical harmonic y. Now my l equals 2, my n equals 0. Oh, sorry, n is 0. And my variables are theta and phi. Okay? So this is my D1. Now I need to find D2. <clears throat> so what I do is copy this. My D2 is defined as R32 divided by square root of 2 into the sum of two kinds of spherical harmonics. One has an n of 2, the other has an n of minus 2.
I can simplify this a little bit for your convenient viewing. And to simplify this further, okay, this is a real function. It's going to be an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. If you put this inside the integral, for it turns you make the potential act on this function, you get the same function back again. Okay, so this I've defined d2. I defined the second orbital. Now I can define d3. All of these are d orbitals. My d3 is defined as. I, now I take the negative of this. Not. So I multiply this with minus iota. Let's simplify this. Okay, so now I get real function d3 the third d orbital and I consider the crystal field Hamiltonian okay now let's do d4 d4 is thing with the plus iota spherical harmonic to 1 1 plus Right, I get D4. Likewise, I can get D5. <coughs> D5. Alright, so this is also real. So I have generated all five orbitals, the wave functions, which are depend upon R, theta, and phi. Now I would like to put these in into the expect into the calculation of the expectation values, which are just the corrections, the first order corrections to the energy. So I also need to calculate the complex conjugates of these functions. Right? So I need to do that. So I, I need to define the complex form. D1C is conjugate of D1. But the problem is that Mathematica doesn't know whether R, theta and phi are real or not. So I would like to simplify this a little bit. I would like to tell Mathematica that these are real numbers. R is real, theta is real and phi all of them are reals let's see if mathematica can okay and a is also real it's more radius okay so it's stuck with this now let's see if i can put this all right so i've defined the conjugate the complex conjugate of of one of the wave functions okay so when you do mathematical programming in a, in, in a software like Mathematica you have to tell it precisely that which variable is real and which one is now I can do this for all the wave functions okay. I'm defining the complex conjugates Yeah. So let's check that. D5C 
is this equal to d5 yes okay so this is true for all of them good this formula will also work if you don't construct real functions so anyway so now what we have we've defined all the now let's find out the corrections to the energies e1 is now I have to form this integral over there. I forget about the coefficient e q over 4 pi epsilon naught. So I'm expressing the energy in units of e q over 4 pi epsilon naught. So I'm forget I'm forgetting this thing for the time being, and I'm forgetting this thing for the time being. Okay, so I'm forgetting these in on, on Mathematica. I don't want to plug these into Mathematica. I'll put them in later at the end. So now my E1 is, I need to integrate. What do I need to integrate? I need to integrate over all of volume, which means I need to integrate with this metric R square sine theta. First of all, I need to write x in terms of theta. I need to convert this into polar coordinates. Now I need to integrate with, with this metric because I'm integrating over volume. R square sine theta is the volume metric for integration over volume into d1 conjugate with just d1. So I multiply this with d1 and another d1. Okay. And I need to multiply this with v. I've defined my v. This is my potential. Let's call, this is my V, right? Which I have put in here. If I write V now, this is my V over here. Because I put this into polar coordinates. So I multiply this with V. This is just an expression of the integral over there. I have the wave function, its complex conjugate, the wave V and the wave function. And since all of these are position variables, they mutually commute. Now I need to define the limits of integration. Theta goes from 0 to pi. Phi goes from 0 to 2 pi. And R goes from 0 to infinity. Okay, I get this value. This is the correction to the energy in the presence of the crystal field if that single electron happens to lie in the orbital which we call d1, which is dz squared. Now let's find the corrections to all five of these orbitals. Just out of curiosity, you might like to find out what happens if I put d1 here and do d2 here. This is 0 because d1 is an eigenstate of v and d1 and d2 are mutually orthogonal. Okay, So you can also prove that all five of these orbitals are mutually orthogonal. And you also need to normalize, which means you need to divide each one of these energies by this thing, by the normalization factor. If you like it, this is 1 because What's in your table, there are coefficients with each wave function which normalize the wave function. So in the table that I provided, you provided with normalized wave function. So everything is normalized. You have to take that into account as well. So, so the range of functions in the simple harmonics you're using, they're already normalized, which is why this is not What's given in your table is normalized. Some authors would give you tables in which these are not normalized. Okay? So normalization is always tricky. It's, you just need to do proper bookkeeping to see if things are properly normalized. Now we would like to find the corrections to all five orbitals in energy. So this is E2. I simply replace D1 by D2. I 
I get an entity that's similar. That's good because the d orbitals were originally degenerate. Now let's look at d3. I get a different energy this time. D3 orbital has a different energy than D1 and D3. Previously, all five of these orbitals have the same energy. So there's also a minus sign. Yeah, minus sign, right? Good. The expectation value of energy can be minus, the correction can be negative. <coughs> For D3, D4 and D5, all three energies are the same. So this cluster of five states, five degenerate states, has now split up into two clusters. Just like exchange interaction. By the way, I would also like you to see how these orbitals look like. If I plot spherical 3D, I should really plot the probability densities. So I plot D1 into D1. Right. Over some. Uh, okay, I, I don't want to plot all of D one because they have R components as well. I just plot the spherical harmonics. Okay. I I don't want to plot the R component. That's going to be a big mess harmonic. Let's plot d z square. Theta 5 square multiplied with itself, right? Where theta goes from 0 to pi and pi goes from 0 to 2 pi. This is just this plot of the spherical harmonic, the angular part of the wave function. Plot spherical plot, sorry. Spherical plot. Okay, this is the dz square orbital, the probability density of it. Okay. Likewise, I can plot With an under root 2 factor as well, but I'm not don't care about this for the time being. Uh, but this okay, so this is I have a, a my iota as well. Y square. Good. This is the D X square minus Y square. Likewise, I can plot this. Just I'm worrying a little bit about the complex conjugates. Okay, so this is another thing. This is, another, this is another one of them. Okay. Likewise, I can plot all of these d orbitals. So now I have five different kinds of energies. D1 and D2 have these energies which are the same and D3, D4 and D5 have different energies. Now each one of these is being multiplied with an E into Q. Q is negative, E is positive with minus sign. So minus EQ is a positive number. So D1 and D2 have higher energies and D3, D4 and D5 have lower energies. So let's 
find out how these energy levels are split in the presence of the orthorhombic cubic symmetric field. And then we'll take a five minute break. So initially, the atomic orbitals for a D1 electron, all five states were degenerate. Now D1 and D2 are raised in energy. Which means that these states are dz squared and dx squared minus y squared. <coughs> okay? And we have three states which are lowered in energy. And they remain degenerate. So degeneracy has been lifted by virtue of the crystal field. So these three states are the dxy, dxz, and the dyz states. <coughs> now, if you find out the amount of splitting, okay, so this is a constant, okay, so this is just going to normalize. If you just find out how much this is split and how much this is lifted, how much this is lowered and how much this is lowered, then you will find out the following. This is increased by 25515. So if this gap is say delta, delta, then the amount by this is raised is 25515 over 25515 plus 17010 delta. Let's find out what this fraction is. This fraction is 25515 divided by 25515 plus 17010. 3 over 5. This is raised by 3 over 5. Now, if this total gap is delta, Okay, so I put this sign, this is conventional. Then this raising of energy is 3 by 5 of delta. And this lowering of energy is going to be 2 by 5 of delta. But there are 3 levels here and 2 levels here. So the center of gravity of, these, of this multiplet remains the same. This is exactly similar to what you saw when you had an exchange interaction. In which there were 3 kinds of triplets, one kind of singlet. The triplet was raised by one unit, whereas the singlet was lowered or raised by three units. So the center of gravity of this multiplet does not change. And you can actually calculate this delta. This delta is just going to be the difference of these energies. Okay, so the delta for an orthogonal or a D1 ion placed inside an orthogonal environment is going to be there's an A naught 4 over D5 then there is EQ over 4 pi epsilon naught then there is a 7 Seven, there's a 7 over 2 d5 there's this term over here why is this a naught 4 over d5 oh, so, so, okay okay that's already included okay yes you're right so this is already included and you have 2 5 5 1 5 minus minus of this which is this 17010 zero, zero. this is the octahedral splitting okay it's a function of the Bohr radius it's a function of the distance 
smaller this distance, bigger will be the splitting, which means higher the interaction. Now, if you want to look at this graphically, what's happening is you have dz squared orbital, which is increasing its energy, and you have the d x y x squared minus y squared, which is increasing its energy, and this makes intuitive sense as well because the electron is placed here on this axis in the dz square orbital the electronic density makes overlap with this in ionic charge and the energy of the system is raised so these orbitals overlap with the ions and both of them are negatively charged so the energy of the system is raised likewise for these for this system the ions are placed here So this raises the energy of the system. For the other three kinds of orbitals, for example, for the dxy orbital, the anions are placed here, but the wave function, the probability density, avoids the electrons. So the energy of this configuration is lower than this configuration. So everything is making physical sense as well. Hence, what we have here is due to the crystal field, the degeneracy in the d orbital is lifted. Now you have one electron. If you have one electron, that of course goes into the low energy state, into one of these orbitals. We'll also see after a five minute break what's going to happen if we have more electrons and what happens if the environment is tetrahedral. All right. so let's take a five minute break. Let's reconvene in five minutes.